scripture this morning. Let us pray that. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we read it this day, we ask that you would move on our hearts to understand it and to take it to heart. We might grow closer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You're reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, starting with verse 44. Jesus here is teaching the disciples, and he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore. Then they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but the bad they threw away. So be at the end of the age, the angels would come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure, things new and old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There's a man who said that he had a crystal dish that he found that looked quite old, so he took it to the antique road show to have them appraise it. And he said, they told me that it was priceless. He said, so I went, he said, last week I sold it for $2 at a yard sale. Who's laughing now? He misunderstood my priceless. A woman, after discovering that her date was uh, actually 42 years old, said, you told me you were 28 and a half. And they responded, well, if you think about it, I am. 28 plus half of that 14 is 42. So, well, maybe this one gets you to found it. Um, in real life, um, I worked at Shoney's as a, as a manager. And one night, an order came in. The lady wanted her hamburger steak cooked well done, almost burnt, because the doctor had told her that she shouldn't have red meat. <laughs> Didn't have the heart to tell her that's not exactly what I mean. well, These are funny little stories, of course, that, that talk about the importance of understanding things. We talk about that quite a bit, understanding and misunderstanding. Misunderstanding, uh, you know, we might misunderstand uh, a word's meaning, like priceless, or we might uh, have somebody that intentionally wants us to misunderstand, like the person said they were 28 and a half. Uh, we might misunderstand some instructions like the, the lady and her doctor. Uh, there are whole TV shows built out of misunderstanding. Have you ever seen that show uh, from the 70s and 80s, Three's Company? Every single episode is a misunderstanding. Somebody misunderstood what somebody else said, and then, you know, hilarity ensues from there. And so uh, we certainly understand what it means to misunderstand. And in uh, the scriptures, we often see that the disciples of Jesus are kind of like the three's company bunch and that they seem to misunderstand almost everything. They misunderstand uh, what Jesus says and what he does and they have to ask for explanations. And sometimes they think they have it down pat and Jesus has to correct them. But here, Jesus asks them if they understand and they say they do. And Jesus doesn't correct them. He explains one parable to them and then tells them three more and say, do you understand this? They say, we do. And he accepts that they do. And I think that is because of what Jesus has to say here, despite using the parables, and despite a little bit we may see in here, uh, they're actually pretty clear what they have to say. Sometimes you know what Jesus has to say it turns the whole world upside down and needs explanation. Sometimes it so clashes uh, with what the world expects and teaches us that it needs explanation. And always, of course, what he has to say you know, has depths to it that we could write whole volumes on just a single phrase, even the same here. But here in these parables, what Jesus has to say is pretty straightforward, about as straightforward as you can get. And a parable that we didn't read, which happened just before this, in which Jesus explains to the disciples, a sower has sowed seeds in the field, and they're good seed, and they grow up to be good plants. But then an enemy sowed bad seeds among them uh, that were weeds. And so you had the weeds and the good, uh, good plants growing together. The servants noticed this and reported to the owner of the field and said, do you want us to go out and cut the weeds down? 
And the owner said, no, let them grow together, and then on the harvest day, we'll separate them, put the good in the barn, and then the, the bad will burn up in the fire. Jesus explains that he is the good sower and that the good plants are the children of God, that the bad seed are, are what the devil has sown, and that the good and bad grow together side by side to the end of time, and then there will be a separation. And the closing parable is much like it. And instead of seed, you have fish. You have a fisherman throws a dragnet over the side, and as he moves along, the dragnet catches everything in its path. And the parable says that it catches all sorts of fish, all different types, some good, some bad, some clean, some unclean. And they swim together, and they're together in the net until at the very end they're brought to shore. And once again, there's a separation. The good will be kept, and the bad cast away. And this is very stark. We aren't used to hearing it often in our world today. But I think Jesus tells it so plainly because of that, so that we can understand it and not misunderstand it. In short, there is good, there is bad, and there is judgment and separation. The good will be sustained and the bad cast aside. But in this world, they all grow together and swim side by side. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Uh, the actual, in that parable itself, talking about the weeds and the wheat, uh, the type of word that is given for a weed means a particular weed uh, that has a name I can't say from up here. Uh, but you can imagine farmers cussing at it because it looked just like the wheat uh, and grew and looked like the wheat until it got to a certain point and then it was dangerous and would kill off the wheat. And so, uh, you know, it looked, they all looked the same to start out with, but then after a while, this bad plant uh, would kill off the wheat. And so uh, that's what we see here uh, is that the weeds are, are taken out. And so in the middle of these two parables that talk about the separation, uh, there are two parables that are also related to one another. They're about the same. In one, a man finds a field that has a treasure in it. And he goes and sells everything that he has in order to buy the field with the treasure. And then in the second parable, a man falls, a, finds a flawless, perfect pearl. It's a once-in-a-lifetime find. So he is willing to sell everything that he has in order to go buy this one-time treasure. In both of these, there is something so precious that somebody gives up everything else they have in order to get that treasure. And of course, in the plain reading of this, the treasure is the kingdom of God. Uh, it's a pearl of, of great price, it is the treasure, and so valuable that its value exceeds anything that can be compared to it. And so the kingdom of God, from what Jesus is saying, will be full of those who see its worth, <coughs> and all they have and all they are. Uh, you know, if our goal uh, is primarily and centrally the kingdom of God and living in it, then we will seek the things that God puts before us to seek. And of course, central to that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the central focus of our faith. It is He who saves us. We are saved through Him. It is He who brings us through. He is the sower of the good seed. And so we have faith in Him, and our focus is on Him. And therein is maybe a little twist to this parable, uh, the two about the, the things of great price being bought, because they can also be seen and interpreted as Jesus being the one who buys the treasure. He goes and gives up all he is and all he has, comes down from the glories of heaven and being the Son of God, God the Son, and pours it all out for the treasure that he loves, which are his people. Pours it out for the pearl of great price, which he loves, which are his people. And so he is willing to give all he has to buy what to him is a treasure. And so to us, that should be very powerfully meaningful to us, that the Lord loves us so much. And he sees us as a treasure that he's willing to give everything for it, and that he did. And so these two really kind of go hand in hand. We give up everything to, to find the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God, our Lord, has already given up everything to come and get us. And so we find that when we do something, God has already done before us to bring us to himself. And what a blessing that is. So buying that field, buying that pearl of great price is focusing on one thing that is worth more than anything else, and that is our Lord. And our Lord has focused on us as his treasure. And we have to let the Holy Spirit guide us in focusing on the kingdom. The Spirit is insistent, but is always a gentleman, as I always heard. The Holy Spirit will never make you do anything you don't want to do. You know, some people, when they think about the Holy Spirit, they think about people you know, getting up dancing down the aisles and things like that. And if the Holy Spirit hits you, you want to do that, go right ahead. 
But don't think the Holy Spirit will force you to do that. The Spirit doesn't. The Spirit's a gentleman will always uh, work with you. And uh, But the Spirit is insistent. and will bring to heart and mind the things that we need. Uh, the Spirit will bring to attention the things that God has said to us uh, that maybe we've forgotten. My father said that when he went into the service, he had been going to church as a little child, but not a whole lot. His parents weren't very big churchgoers. But he said he never realized how much scripture he had absorbed in vacation Bible school and other things until he went in the army. And he said every time he tried to do something bad, the scripture came to his mind and ruined any fun he was going to have. And so he had to not do it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Not the Holy Spirit ruins any fun we're going to have. But the Holy Spirit brings to mind things that we maybe have forgotten. We're also told that the Spirit will give us the words that we need. You know, sometimes we think, uh, you know, I can't speak. I'm not knowledgeable on the subject. I'm not very fluent, we might think. You know, other people speak so much better than me. Uh, but it's not that that makes an impact. There was a famous Baptist minister uh, from years ago uh, who was known for his eloquence and one sermon he stood up and preached, and he was not eloquent at all. He stumbled over everything that he said. He was ashamed of that sermon, but afterwards, he had one of the biggest responses he'd ever had to a sermon. And one of the fellows that came up to him said, I've heard him preach many sermons, and that's the best one I've ever heard. And he said it felt like the Lord was telling him, it's not your eloquence that makes any difference. It's the Lord's Spirit that makes a difference. So the Lord will give us the words that we need uh, in our lives when we need them. The Spirit guides us, protects us, comforts us, uh, gives us wisdom, warns us, and uh, also gives us the peace that passes understanding and the joy of our salvation. And so we need to give room to the voice of the Spirit in seeking the kingdom of God. The Spirit speaks to each of us. And uh, so we do that by, as it tells us in the Scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. When we seek the kingdom, all the other things will come in. When we seek anything else, we'll lose it and everything else besides. Seek the kingdom and gain all. Seek anything else and lose all. And so as Jesus tells his disciples in closing here, that's everybody's favorite word in closing. Focus on that one. But in closing, he says, if we do that, we'll be like a householder who knows the treasures in his house and knows what his house contains and can bring out what is needed, good and bad, both old and new when it's needed. My grandfather was kind of like that. He collected everything. He had a smokehouse behind his house that when he passed away, we went back there. And it was jam-packed with all sorts of stuff. He had every tool known to humankind, it seemed like. And half of them, we had no idea what they even did. But he collected them. And in his life, whenever we needed anything, he'd go back to that smokehouse, he'd have something to fix it. Whatever it was. And so that is what we are to be like uh, with the treasures of God. God gives us treasures in his promises. God gives us uh, his armor to protect us and his promises to sustain us, uh, his spiritual gifts to help us work and the fruit of the Spirit uh, to help us live and the sword of the Lord, which is his word that cuts to the chase. And that is what the Lord gives us uh, that we can use in our lives, but we need to focus on him. The scripture tells us that where the treasure is of our hearts, uh, that will be where our heart is. Where our treasure is, that's where our hearts be. Uh, you know, what you love the most, that is where your heart will be. And so we need to ask ourselves, where is our treasure? What is our treasure? Is our treasure something eternal or something temporary? Something that lasts forever or something that will pass away? Where do our hearts lie? Let us pray. Lord, help our hearts to seek the eternal things, to seek you and your kingdom first knowing that all else will be added unto us. Help us, Lord, to, to seek the pearl of, of great price, knowing that you have already bought the pearl of great price, us, uh, with all of your love and grace. Lord, help us to follow you and to seek you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.